How well do you know your family tree? Could you sit down and draw it? What would it look like? How many branches would it have? And how big could you make it? No matter who you are, it is safe to say that you don't know everything about your family. You can only know so much about the history of your family and how it has changed over the generations. At some point, you will have to stop adding branches to your tree. But what if you could keep adding branches to your tree indefinitely? What if you could make your tree impossibly large and complex? What if you could make your tree as large as it possibly could be? You could trace your lineage, in theory, all the way back to the beginning of life itself and see how your ancestors evolved over time from simple organisms into the complex life form that you are today. Although a universal family tree is logistically impossible to create, it's not entirely a ridiculous proposition. There is a popular metaphor in science called the tree of life. In this tree, we don't connect individuals. Instead, we connect different types of organisms, taxa like animals, plants, fungi, protists, and bacteria. In this tree, each leaf is a species. And altogether, the leaves represent the vast diversity of life forms that live on our planet. Although it may be impossible to create a truly complete tree of life, it does help us to understand the relationship between the various forms of life on Earth. And importantly, the tree of life provides a model and a research tool for exploring how life has evolved over time. Phylogenetics is the study of the diversification of life, its evolutionary history, and the relationships among living things that have developed over time. For this reason, trees like this one and the tree of life are typically called phylogenetic trees. But how exactly do we produce them? It makes sense to begin by thinking about the species that are the leaves of our trees. As you know, taxonomy is the science of defining, naming, and classifying groups of species, which we call taxa. In earth and life science, we typically use a hierarchical system of classification called Linnaean taxonomy. Species are the fundamental units in this scheme, and they are repeatedly grouped into larger and more inclusive taxa. The groups are based on the similarities of the species. If two species are similar, they are combined into a genus. If two genera are similar, they are combined to make a family, and so forth. Dogs and wolves make up the genus Canis. Dogs, wolves, and foxes make up the family Canidae. As you can see, each individual taxon has certain defining characteristics, or characters. The overarching goal of taxonomy is to identify taxa which are easy to recognize and identify. However, when it comes to figuring out evolutionary relationships, taxonomy has a critical limitation. Consider this example. 
There are four living species in the genus Ursus. Brown bears, polar bears, American black bears, and Asian black bears. Obviously, all of these animals are related to each other. No one would dispute that they are similar. It makes perfect sense then that there is a genus of bears. But the problem is, this taxonomy tells us nothing about the ancestry of the bears themselves. There are four species in the genus Ursus. The taxonomy doesn't tell us which of them are most closely related to each other. To begin to make a phylogenetic tree like this one, which shows you the lineages of the various bear species, we need to take a different approach. This approach is called cladistics. Cladistics is the reconstruction of evolutionary relationships on the basis of characters of organisms that they have derived from their ancestors. The overarching goal of cladistics is to produce phylogenetic trees or cladograms like this one, which illustrates the evolutionary histories of apes, including humans, chimps, gorillas, and various monkeys. As you can see, we humans, homo sapiens, are most closely related to extinct species of bipedal apes like Homo erectus and Australopithecus, and our closest living relatives are chimpanzees. Obviously, we create these cladograms by considering the characteristics of the organisms. But what characters do we actually consider, and how is it done? Well, in cladistics, we consider all characteristics. In theory, any feature of an organism can potentially help produce a cladogram. These characters include observable things like hair, teeth, or opposable thumbs. They also include things that can be identified and measured in a laboratory, like the unique genetic codes in the DNA of an organism. Regardless of what they are, the best characters are what we call synapomorphies, or homologous characters. These are characters that are shared by two or more species because they were present in their last common ancestor. As an example, the last common ancestors of you and your cousin are your grandparents. You and your cousin may look similar to each other because you are related to each other on some level and share the common ancestry of your grandparents. All life on Earth has descended from a single common ancestor, the grandparent of all organisms. For this reason, all life forms on our world share a few characters in common. They have at least a few synapomorphies. Like cells. Cells are one of the most basic synapomorphies in the tree of life. It doesn't matter if it's a brain-eating amoeba or a human being. All life forms on Earth consist of one or more cells. Cells are a synapomorphy. Of course, we humans possess many characters that distinguish us from things like amoeba. Like bipedalism. Bipedal animals, like us, walk around on two legs as opposed to, say, four or more. This character evolved in our distant ancestor, Australopithecus, and has been passed down to us over millions of years, from one generation to the next. Australopithecus is extinct now, but body fossils of its bones, 
as well as trace fossils of its footprints and trackways, tell us that Australopithecus evolved bipedalism more than three and a half million years ago. Over millions of years, from one generation to the next, bipedalism was passed from Australopithecus onto Homo erectus, and eventually onto us, Homo sapiens. It is this synapomorphy, along with many others, that tell scientists that we evolved from Australopithecus. It is one of our distant ancestors. Overall, it is the study of synapomorphies and how they are distributed among life forms on Earth that allows us to reconstruct evolutionary histories and produce cladograms like this one. Of course, not all characters are synapomorphies, and so not all characters are as useful as bipedalism is. For example, some characters are unique to certain species and taxa. Take this example dealing with leglessness in snakes. In this case, leglessness is an apomorphy. Snakes evolved from lizards with legs, but subsequently lost them. Knowing that snakes are legless does not help us to determine their evolutionary history. In other words, Leglessness is a useless character. More troubling, however, are characters which appear to be synapomorphies, but are actually something very different. We call these characters analogous characters, or homoplasy. Analogous characters are features that have evolved independently in two or more lineages. A textbook example of homoplasy is wings. Wings have evolved in birds, bats, insects, and pterosaurs, which were giant reptiles that lived during the Mesozoic era. At first glance, one might suspect that these organisms are closely related to each other because they all possess wings. But if one looks closer, they find a variety of differences between them. Birds have feathers. Pterosaurs and bats do not. Pterosaurs instead had small hair-like projections on their bodies. And bats, of course, have fur. Bats also produce milk and give birth to live young, unlike pterosaurs and birds which lay eggs. If one considers all of the characters of these animals, it becomes clear that bats are much more closely related to mammals. After all, they are basically just flying rats. Cladistic analysis demonstrates that wings and powered flight evolved in birds and then separately again in bats due to convergent evolution. Convergent evolution happens when two organisms evolve adaptations to deal with similar environments. Another example of convergent evolution is fins in dolphins, sharks, and extinct reptiles from the Mesozoic called ichthyosaurs. Again, none of these animals are closely related to each other but they all look the same. The reason for this is because they all inhabited the same environments over Earth history. As a result, they have evolved similar bodies to help them cope with their environmental conditions. The good news is homoplasy isn't really an issue if we have lots of characters. As a rule in cladistics, the more characters, the better. The more characters you have, the more likely it is that you will be able to distinguish between synapomorphies and analogous characters. If you can do that, 
You can use your synapomorphies to generate cladograms that accurately represent evolutionary history. Now, as we conclude our look at phylogenetics and cladistics, it is important to remember the value of the fossil record in studying evolutionary history. Fossils provide a wealth of information about the evolutionary relationships among organisms. But perhaps more importantly, fossils allow you to begin to consider when exactly there were branching and speciation events. By considering fossils, we can determine not simply what happened, but when. By leveraging the fossil record, along with cladistics, scientists have begun to piece together the evolutionary history of life on Earth over the past four billion years. There is much left to learn, and the universal family tree is bound to grow as we continue to, to discover new species, both living and extinct. Even so, we already can say so much about where we come from.